believe there are only four religious systems in the world. Mm. One of which is the truth and the other three are false. Now that's quite a bold statement to make because they are legion. <laughs> <laughs> but they only fall into three categories, the false religions, as far as I'm concerned. It, see, it comes back to there's only one way. One way. There's not many ways. No. So the truth must be centered in Jesus Christ and his word, and the false religious systems fall into categories, dragon, beast, and false prophet religions. Because that's what the Bible says. Yeah. So what is a dragon religion, what is a beast religion, and what is a false prophet religion? Mm. We need to have Study. a look at that, right? Mm. Revelation 16 verse 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Those are the three categories where the unclean spirits work. Yeah. So if you can recognize a dragon religion, if you can recognize a beast religion, and if you can recognize a false prophet religion, then you should be okay. And your word, the word is the filter and the law. Exactly. Of the three, I would say uh, the tricky one is the false prophet. Yes, because He's that one uh, is sneaky. Yes. Okay. There's another verse in verse 19. And the great city, that's Babylon, mm. was divided into three parts. And since Babylon comprises all religions, it seems that there are only three parts to that Babylon. That's true. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came to the remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Isn't it important to warn the Babylonians? Exactly. And then you have to define the Babylonians. And you can't warn without defining. We've said that many times. All right, you're not fighting alone in this, because we read here that God is drawing those who listen to conscience take counsel with right reason and with God and surrender their will, their entire prospects, with the whole heart to God. It is then and only then that the human agents learns how wayward is the heart and how unwilling to give up all for Jesus. So Martin, here's another point. If you are not willing to give up all, it's all, not so some. The, so the rich young ruler was required to give up all. That's it. And he didn't realize that if he gives up all, he actually gains all. This doesn't mean you give up literally physical all. It means everything. You might actually have to give up physically all exactly. only to get it back again. It might include that. Yes. Because nobody who's left father or mother for my name's sake will not receive in this world yeah. and in the next. And seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all, all these, these things, things shall be. So, isn't that what a little child believes? Exactly. If you are, if you are a good little boy, then you're going to get this. That's true. You, re uh, you get rewarded. Yes. But if they walk in the light, well, they have the light to subdue selfishness and expel it from the soul. Truth has the ascendancy. There's a sense of spiritual freedom. They rejoice in the glorious liberty of the sons and daughters of God and be encountered. Mm. If you accept the truth, you're going to tug on the chain uh, that binds you to Satan's chariot and he is going to mess with you. Yeah. In the world, they were gliding along peaceably, but now they have to stem the current of popular opinion. As they turn from the maxims and customs of popular professors of religion, the conflict begins in earnest. They must contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. Martin, if you, if you are not in the spiritual war, how can you become a hardened soldier? You I mean, uh, a fit soldier to fight the battle. And you see, that's where I think sometimes the problem comes in. A lot of people don't want conflict or they don't want to stand out. No. So now you come to ecumenical uh, gather gatherings or movements or anything that's like that and you blend in. You can't blend in because you have to tug on the chain. Mm. So the conflict begins. They must contend for this faith or be carried away 
from the light, away from the truth into error and darkness to final ruin. What is it that causes this contention? It is the collision of error against truth. The tyrant is seeking to oppress man's conscience that Christ has made free. Persecution will come more definitely and decidedly upon the people of God because the godly are seeking for uprightness and holiness and the disobedient are in sin. How can something that feels so good be wrong? Mm. I just heard that the other day again. That's it. And I also heard just the other day, will God condemn this love? Yeah. Don't confuse love with con infatuation. Ooh. You know, we've spoken of this before, but the definition of love according to the Bible and according to Hollywood is like the East is from the West. But unfortunately, the world is conditioned with the Hollywood love. Yes. The sin-loving do not choose the way of God and the obedient in their character and course of action are a constant rebuke to the sinful. When the truth finds access to the heart, it must fight every inch of the way. Mm -hmm. It is a battle and there's no way getting around it. You cannot sugarcoat this one. This is the way it is. And if you're not prepared to fight this battle, well, then you can't get to the top of the mountain. Unfortunately, no. that's, we've read that before. The believers in the truth are guarded jealously as the heart of God. In the fierce conflict before us, mind with mind, truth in collision with error, principle with principle, this world will witness scenes that are intensely interesting, of immense importance. Are we, are we in that time? <laughs> Definitely. Are we ha seeing scenes that boggle the mind? Yeah, more and more. And many, even of, of those that were not in true religion, are seeing that something is wrong. Yes. Isn't it now necessary that we speak? It's now or never. In many churches, the truth will be sacrificed and error presented in its place. Those who cease to occupy the elevated position as watchmen, receiving the word from God and giving the warning to the people, are not aware that they are arranging themselves under the black banner of the power of darkness, with the enemies of God and the truth. So if you do not resist with every fiber of your being and preach the truth in opposition to error, you're going to be swept away. Well, if we have followed what was said here earlier, those who cease to occupy the elevated position as watchmen. So if we decide to get off the wall, what is going to happen to us? You will be in trouble. The people receive the words from their lips and in turn repeat the same error to those brought in connection with them. Thus the wine of Babylon is received and all nations become drunken with a spiritual poison. We see that those who will not receive the truth are preparing to resist its influence. They refuse to be recast in faith and character. They are unwilling to be remodeled in the image of Christ's character. But if you bring the truth and people resist it and refuse to accept it, it's no point. And you can get disheartened. But God says he will help you to change your character. But you must be willing. You must be willing, yes. And that's the thing that comes into the all. You must be willing to, in all aspects, let him change what is needed. Yes, and uh, I say that's why he's given you and me wives, right? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Make sure we remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's have a look at a typology. And it's, it's a well-known typology, but I believe it's so important for the time we are living in. Because this just happened before they went into Canaan, the Israelites. Yeah, this is so. Uh, I love, you know. I didn't know anything about type and anti-type before I became an Adventist. And through a lot of your lectures and all of this studying the spirit of prophecy, the Bible really opens up to you. Yes. Once you start understanding this, and so let's have a look at some of the points and see if we can glean some something interesting. Just looking at the story of Balak, the Moabite king who wanted to curse Israel, and the false prophet Balaam, who actually was used by God as a true prophet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
what do these names mean? Balak means waster. Mm. So he wants to waste God's people. And Balaam means not of the people. Yeah. Hmm. Martin say if somebody is not of the people and is trying to convince you to do something that is contrary to your conscience, then uh, you better beware. If somebody is not of the people, what people? People of the book, right? Correct. And people of the law. Part of the little children. You have to be like a little child. Numbers 23, verse 28, And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor, that looketh towards Yeshimon. Such nice names in the <laughs> Bible. I love these names. So Peor means gap. Yes. And there was a deity that was worshipped there. Mm. And they sacrificed children to him even. And Yeshimon means desolation. Desolation. So when Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor, that looks towards Yeshimon, it literally means there's a gap and you're looking towards desolation. A little bit like our backdrop uh, over here. This was taken in the Richtersfeld. Yes. Which is a, which is a desert like area. If you can see it. It's desolation. Beautiful. Yeah. It's it's beautiful, but and it rugged. shows you it's it's rugged like you just it's mentioned. like the narrow path. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. And there were three attempts to curse Israel. So three angles of attack. We mm. said there are only three false religions. Yes. So maybe we can pick up three angles of attack and see how they work and how they operate. So in the first oracle, Balaam failed to curse Israel. Mm. In the second oracle, Balaam blessed Israel. <laughs> By now, Balak's wheels were coming off, right? <laughs> And in the third oracle, he actually cursed Balak. <laughs> Imagine you're getting somebody to do a job for you and then eventually... And it ends up this way. <laughs> so his final oracle, because there was another one, is not an attempt to curse them, but a prophecy concerning the last days. And we, that's why we also did that study to show this is the Christian era yes. that we're talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Little children, this is the last days. Exactly. Little, and it's referring to little children. It's referring to little children. All right. So you have to believe what God said. Mm. And if God said it, he meant it. And then you do it. Because like we've seen, if you just believe it, <laughs> you have two legs. You have to do it as well. Not enough. So let's look at the story. Balak summons Balaam. Now we're not going to go into the whole story of the donkey and all mm. of those, how he came. He was, you know, he was such a stubborn man. He wanted... Filthy Luca. Yeah. But uh, God said to him, okay, you can go, but you will say only what I say. Numbers 22, verse 1, And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plain of Moab on this side, Jordan, by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. Balaam's first oracle. Now, Martin, if we had to choose, is this a dragon art, um, oracle? Is this a beast oracle? Is this a false prophet mm -hmm. oracle? Perhaps so it has to fit into three religious systems, right? Obviously, so then there has to be certain criteria, probably. Yeah, so type has to meet anti-type. And Balaam said unto Balak, this is another prophet, telling Balak, who is a waster, a destroyer, mm -hmm. parallel destroyer in the days that we are living in. Yes, yes Satan. there will be. Build me here seven altars and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. So here is a sacrificial system similar to that of Israel. Yes, also with sacrificing and everything. Yes, yes. and they were sacrificing clean animals, mm. oxen and rams. Mm. So if something looks right, it doesn't mean that it is right, right? Oh, that's true. Okay. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. So here the two of them 
the two systems are working together. There's something wrong there. Yes. If you see the prophet working together at a sacrificial service mm -hmm. with the pagans who are not serving the true God, then you better be scared of them. True. So when you see someone who says he is religious yeah. and he is a follower of Christ and he is proclaiming in the name of Christ, but he's standing next to and participating at the pagan altar, mm. you better be scared of him. And not mingle. or You better be scared of yeah. him. That should be a sign. Stay away, right? Of course, yes. Okay. <laughs> you must run. You must run. So they were offering together. So that is an ecumenical altar if two systems offer sacrifices together. Can't be. You can't mix truth and error. You can't mix paganism and true religion. Didn't we see that? We saw that. So that's a clue. That's a clue. And Balaam said unto Balak, Stand by thy burnt offering, and I will go. Peradventure the Lord will come to meet me, and whatsoever he showeth me, I will tell thee. And he went to a high place. Mm -hmm. Now what did they do on the high places? They sacrificed, but, right? But to idol gods. Idol gods. He went to a high place. If you go to a high place, then you better watch it. Mm. So if somebody says to me, I'm going to worship uh, on Carmel, where there is a Baha'i temple, I would be reticent, <laughs> to say the least, right? Okay, and God met Balaam. So God made sure that there was no other influence. He was going to give the right message to Balaam. Yeah. And he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. Do you think God was impressed? No. <laughs> I don't think he was impressed at all. No. All right, when Jeroboam made a altar which was not in accordance with God's wishes, was God impressed? No. So it might look to everybody, oh, look how wonderful this guy is. He's yes. actually worshipping God. God's not impressed. No, God was not impressed. And Jeroboam, Jeroboam's entire lineage was wiped out, right? Mm. Okay, so God was not impressed. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. So it was a very you know, spectacular yes. event. Well, it also lets me think of, in vain they worshipped me for teaching the doctrines of men. Yes. And he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab has brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. Now, when the Bible talks about the east, then that's actually where um, Abraham came from. Mm. Ur. Ur of the Chaldeans. Mm -hmm. Now, Haran and all of those places, those were where the children of the east were. But they hadn't committed themselves to God because even the father of Abraham, yeah. he was mingling paganism and, and, and the truth. Yes. So that's error, right? Yeah. Okay. So he came from the east, so he was of, of, of that caliber. Well, I can just mention maybe that people can have a look at your sermon, Terah died in Aram. Uh-huh. Okay. okay, come and curse me, Jacob, and come and defy Israel. And his answer is, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord has not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned amongst the nations. Is that an important point? <laughs> I think it's one of the most important points for Israel. All right. Now, that must irritate the nations. That no, Definitely. If you want to be alone, you don't want to be subjected to their religious norms and standards, uh, and you don't want to be reckoned amongst the nations in terms of worship. You stand out like a sore finger. Yes. Okay. 
But that's a very important criterion that the, do God's people today want to stand alone and <laughs> repentance. He should have recognized yeah. that those are God's people and he should have repented. Yeah. But he's stubborn. He's yeah. like Pharaoh, right? Yeah. yeah. So he's going to give it a second try. So in this first episode, we have pure paganism, which is dragon religion. That's it. And you have Balaam sacrificing with them at the same altar, dragon religion. So beware of dragon religion. Mm. Dragon religion is demonic. Mm. It is contrary to what God is. It's a very deceptive system. Yes. Today we have equivalent spiritu spiritualism. Mm. Spiritualism is a dragon religion. It's a Anything where you talk with demon deities, that's a dragon religion. So the New Age movement yes. is a dragon religion. Okay, so when you start mixing things like you have spiritual formation which makes sp spiritism christian and then you've got spiritual yoga christian yoga uh, and all these remember things remember in babylon the dragon the beast and the false prophet are together mm. so there's a mingling of all of these aspects but here it's very clear that balaam was sacrificing with them at the same altar yeah that's dragon religion so not only was Balaam shown the history, but he behind the prosperity of the true Israel of God to the close of time. He saw the special favor of the Most High attending those who love and fear him. He saw them supported by his arm as they enter the dark valley of the shadow of death. And he beheld them coming forth from their graves crowned with glory, honor, and immortality. That's why he said, let my end be like their end. But of course, his end wasn't like their end, no. as we, were, we will see. And he beheld them coming forth from the grave, crowned with glory, honor, immortality. He saw the redeemed rejoicing in the unfaded glories of the earth made new. Gazing upon the scenes, he, he exclaimed, Who can count the dust of Jacob? And the number of the fourth part of Israel, and as he saw the crown of glory on every brow, the joy beaming from their countenance, he looked towards that endless life of unalloyed happiness. He uttered the solemn prayer, Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. It's actually a beautiful summary of what happened there. Yeah, yeah. So if Balaam had had a disposition to accept the light that God had given, he would now have made true his words. He would at once have severed all connections with Moab. So if you don't sever at once, if you find out that something is wrong, that's a very serious pointer, right? Exactly. You're going to get into trouble. He would no longer have presumed upon the mercy of God, but would have returned to him with deep repentance. But Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness, and these he was determined to secure. So it's a very interesting but sad story. Balak could not even now relinquish his purpose. He decided that the imposing spectacle presented by the vast encampment of the Hebrews had so intimidated Balaam that he dared not practice his divination against them. So, Martin, was Balaam thus a diviner? Yes. Yes, so he was not a true prophet no. of God because that is condemned in the word of God. Exactly. Divination. But uh, it's important to know that God actually used him here. Yes. And the words that we can see coming from him is actually from God. But he wasn't willing to change. No. So the king determined to take the prophet to some point to where only a small part of the host might be seen. If Balaam could be induced to curse them in detached parties, the whole camp would soon be devoted to destruction. Martin, that's a very important point. So he couldn't curse them all. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about God's remnant church, it's not all evil. No. It is God's remnant church. It is the church militant. The wheat and the tares grow together. But he's very successful in cursing little detached parties. Mm -hmm. 
So as long as they stick together in the truth, yeah, they're safe. Yeah, it's a if they wander off that path, they are not safe. If they go and stand at an altar with paganism, they're not safe. So let's just look at this. So this is now the second angle. This is he's now approaching the second angle. Yes, the in in the first one, he saw the whole of Israel. He was blatantly apostate. He sacrificed together with pagans at the same altar. So let's look how he changes his tactic in the second oracle. So let's say it is a beast tactic. Now, a beast tactic is one where you are saved by your works. Mm. The beast is one that negates the law and says you are not saved by the righteousness of Christ, the imputed and imparted righteousness, you are saved by your works. Mm. And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray thee, with me unto another place, from whence thou mayest see them. So let's, let's take another angle. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them and shall not see them all and curse me them from thence. Mm. Be very careful. When one little group starts doing things totally differently to others. Mm, that, oh, that is so important. This is inside of the church. Yes, I'm talking about the church, God's church, what we have to watch out for. Mm. Uh, we don't want to be so closely associated with the Sabbath. Yes. We don't want to you know, seem as though we're legalists and put a lot of emphasis on the law. Mm. Let's rather call ourselves something else like a good deeds church. Yeah. Maybe we can help, you know, do some good deeds on the Sabbath and thereby break the Sabbath in the process. And let Let's not be so different. Mm. Let's and let it. our hair down a little bit. Yes. <laughs> so he brought him into the field Sophim to the top of Pisgah and built seven altars and offered the bullock and a ram on every altar. Same thing. Slightly different. And he said to Balak, Stand here by the burnt offering while I meet the Lord yonder. So he didn't partake with the ritual there. Yes. And he didn't use divination. We'll see what that is in a moment. And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go again unto Balak and say thus. And when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab with him. And Balak said unto him, What has the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Sippor. I have a question here. Why did God permit this charade? Wasn't once enough? No, because he wants all the angles to play out. And he wants to give a lesson here, a very important lesson that we have to yeah. heed. He did it because he wanted to save Moab too, didn't he? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Didn't he want to save Pharaoh? Everybody. He gave him ten chances. Yeah. Now here we're, we're meeting not with Pharaoh alone, but with religious systems. Yeah. So is there another king and his princes that have heard the message from God and refused to listen? Yes. How long have they been sitting in ecumenical council with this prince? Mm. Has he changed? No. So obviously it's not working. No. <laughs> so there's a problem because there's a lesson to be learned. All right. So it, it's not working. No. So what about the little groups? Maybe mm. that can work. Maybe, you know, the little Protestant groups, maybe that'll work. No. So let's try another angle. They've been sitting how long with them in, in this, these circles? The same. Same. It's working. No. No. Like you asked that one person... When they said, yeah, but we're there for friendship and everything, you said, okay, and so how many converted? You said zero. You zero. said, how, many, how long were you there? 17 years. So it's not working. <laughs> I'm doing, yeah. Your method's not working. Sorry. All right. So God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and shall he not do it? Or has he spoken and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He has not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Mm. Who's that king, Martin? Jesus. 
That's King Jesus. I'm, I'm always so concerned when I read other translations and I, and I see this beautiful passage is gone. Yeah, they change it. <laughs> Changed. A shout of a king is amongst them. And I have not beheld iniquity in Jacob. What is iniquity? It's transgression of the law. That's it. So I have not beheld transgression of the law and I haven't seen any perverseness and there's a shout of a king amongst them. God brought them out of Egypt. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Oh, how they love to mock the King James Version about the unicorn, right? Yeah. Let's talk about the unicorn <laughs> a little bit in a while. <laughs> Definitely. So, you know, it's a wild ox now. It's no longer a unicorn. But a unicorn has one horn, and I think an ox has two horns, right? Yes, there's a beautiful reason why it's put in the Bible. And if there is a king amongst them, and there's only one king, and there aren't two kings or ten kings, then surely he has one horn, one kingdom. Why should he be a wild ox and have two horns? Yeah, isn't it also... But let me not, <laughs> let me not digress here. Well, can we also just have a little... Uh, there was one little horn, not two little horns. Yes. So there's either the true king or there is the false king. That's it. And they both have one horn. Yeah. Uh, surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. Neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what has God wrought? So his divination didn't work. We'll see what they did. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift himself up as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. And Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. What are you doing? <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's, all he's now a little bit... <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> he's really angry, but he's not willing to give up yet. But Balaam answered and said, Balak, told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, that I must do. So he has the strength of a unicorn. There's a king amongst them. So the king of Moab, disheartened and distressed, exclaimed, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. Yet a faint hope still lingered in his heart, and he determined to make another trial. He now conducted Balaam to Mount Peor where was a temple devoted to the licentious worship of Baal, their god. Here the same number of altars were erected as before, and the same number of sacrifices were offered. But Balaam went not alone as at the other times to learn God's will. He made no pretense of sorcery, but standing beside the altar, he looked abroad upon the tents of Israel. Again the Spirit of God rested upon him. And the divine message came from his lips. Mm. So now he is not practicing sorcery. No. He's not practicing divination. So it's not blatant. It's not blatant. This is a very dangerous mm. one. He is acting like a true prophet. It's actually now infiltrating. Yes. But he's doing it at the behest of someone. That's a very important exactly. thing. Exactly. Balaam's third oracle, the false prophet versus the true prophet. And like you He's said, actually a false prophet, but God is using him like a true prophet. Yes. Uh, isn't there a false prophet in, in Babylon as well? Yes. Okay. That's a very dangerous one, especially when he is separate and alone. And you don't really know that he's actually doing the bidding of the little horn. I mean the little king mm. that thinks he is like Jesus, right? Exactly. All right, let's look at this third oracle. And Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee, and I will bring thee unto another place. Let's try another angle of attack. Uh -huh. Peradventure it will please God that thou mayest curse me them from thence. And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor that looketh towards Jessamon, wasteland. Yeah. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven bulls and seven rams. So again, it looks like the true religion. It's the same sort of thing. And Balaam did as Balaam had said, and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. 
And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not as at other times to seek enchantments. So he knew he had to change his tactics. So the first two mm. times there were enchantments. Now there were no enchantments. We have to watch out for that. Any form of hocus pocus. Yeah, yeah. Any form of methodology that is practiced to bring you round to their way of thinking, beware of it. Mm. That's where spiritual formation and all that stuff comes in. Be very careful. You see, the, the roots of that is lying in paganism. So, for instance, if we m take the yoga, that's Eastern mysticism. Yes, you can't practice one and say that and you are separating the spiritual from the other because you can't really. No. But he set his face towards the wilderness. So let me sum that up. In the previous two attempts, he must have used enchantments, mm -hmm. right? Or religious practices that were based on pagan rituals, mm -hmm. like reading the will of the gods in the entrails of the animals, for example. Mm -hmm. That's what they did. Today, uh, they will read your future in a teacup. Yeah. If you go to... Or uh, use the stars. Or use the stars or, or whatever. You know, that's what the presidents of the United States used to do. They used to suffer these enchantments. Yeah. And Ronald Reagan, for example, used astrology. Well, I think they're still uh, mostly used these yes, days. absolutely. And in this third attempt, he listened to the voice of God. Isn't this what Protestantism should do? Just listen to the voice? Be like a so he wasn't jumping around doing his thing and doing funny things and things outside of the Bible. So should Protestantism, however, seek to curse those who are obedient to God's commands? No. Do you think it could happen that no. Protestantism will curse those who are mm. obedient to God's commands? Definitely. After all, God had said he has not beheld iniquity in Jacob, so they were keeping the law. That's it, but that's the part if <laughs> that will start to get a little bit more serious in the end. Correct. So if we go to Leviticus and we want to know what is iniquity and if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist it not, yet he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity. He did not behold iniquity, so he was keeping the commandments. And he didn't sin, and sin is the transgression of the law. That's it. It's very simple. It's not... It a little child can know it. A little child can know what's going on. So the law of truth was in his mouth, says Malachi, and iniquity was not found in his lips. So there you have Hebrew parallelism. So if the law of God is in your mouth, then you have no iniquity. He walketh with me in peace and equity and did not turn away from iniquity. So now let's have a look at the interesting signs of a prophet. Now, I believe that this is very specifically also there so that the remnant can take cognizance. Exactly. Because this is a parallel of what will happen at the end. So we have some features here of a true prophet. Yes. Which we can adhere to. Mm -hmm. But if it is in any way aligned to paganism, then we have to be aware of it. That's it. So Balaam lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes and the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor has said, and the man whose eyes are open has said. So now he's prophesying, right? Mm -hmm. He's got the features of a true prophet. Be beware of translations that aren't direct translations. You'll get none of this out of the others. Yeah. They are totally They're distorted. Thank you. So he eyes, the eyes are open. The prophet, when he prophesies under the unction of God, the eyes are open. Mm. And he has said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance is added. Ah. And the King James tells you that it's added by writing it in cursive. So you can read it, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling, falling, but having his eyes open. Not opened. Not opened. B 
because that could be in a spiritual sense. Yes. This is literal. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we go to the spirit of prophecy, when Ellen White had visions, she followed this exact system. Even even the falling happens, and yeah. the and there was no breath in her. No, and the falling just before it's actually they say as if some invisible hand is laying you down. Correct, not a catcher. It's not a yeah. No, not a catcher. It's invisible. There's no you. You just yeah see the person go down. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob? and thy tabernacle, O Israel, as the valleys are, they spread forth as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lime, aloes, which the Lord has planted, and as cedar trees be beside the water. He shall pour the water out of his bucket, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. So his king, Israel's king, is higher than the king, the highest king yeah. of these nations and the Moabites. So this is very interesting. And uh, we need to take cognizance. Every single word is loaded here. It, it has so much value. Obviously, it's talking again about Jesus. That's it, the king. That's the king. That's the king, and he's higher than any earthly king. And his kingdom, higher than any kingdom. Yes. So Balaam prophesied that Israel's king would be greater and more powerful than Agag. This was the name given to the kings of the Amalekites, who were at this time a very powerful nation. But Israel, if true to God, would subdue all their enemies. The king of Israel was the son of God and his throne was one day to be established in the earth and his power to be exalted above all earthly kingdoms. So this kingdom was to eventually be the only one that remained. Yeah. And you're either part of that kingdom or you're not. Take your pick. Numbers 24 verse 8. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Mm -hmm. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with arrows. It's talking about the mighty conqueror, Jesus Christ. Christ. So now people are totally confused. What's this unicorn doing so, in here? So we're back to the unicorn. All right. Here's an article in Creation uh, Today. And this comes from the webpage creation.org. The very first edition of Noah Webster's Dictionary in 1828 lists unicorn with the following definition. An animal with one horn, the monoceros. The name is often applied to the rhinoceros. Notice that this definition says absolutely nothing about a horse or a horse-like animal or Greek mythology or mythical or fictitious creature. This definition simply states that this is a name that is often applied to the rhinoceros. Yet our present day understanding of a rhinoceros is that of a two-horned animal. If we look up the word rhinoceros in the same 1828 dictionary, it defines rhinoceros as a genus of quadrupeds or of two species, one of which the unicorn has a single horn growing almost direct from the nose. This animal, when full grown, is said to be 12 feet in length. There's another species with two horns, the bicornus. They are natives of Asia and Africa. So when you read about unicorn in the Bible, mm -hmm. don't immediately assume that it's referring to a mythological creature. Now the interesting thing is, Martin, when you look at these creatures, here's the name, the scientific name yeah. of, of the rhinoceros with the one horn. This is the Indian rhinoceros. Its name is Rhinoceros unicornus. It even has it in the specific <laughs> name. So is the King James wrong again, no. like everybody wants to say? Or it's does it actually spot on. Well, Martin, that is the living one, and it doesn't have a very impressive horn. No. But, but before that, when they roamed around, this is the end of a long process of adaptation. Definitely not evolution. No. <laughs> Devolution. What did they look like? Probably 
in the days when this was written. Mm. Hmm? Much different. We probably. spoke about evolution last time. We showed what the animals yeah. looked like earlier and that the human beings were much larger, etc. And that they even looked like angels still until the time of Abraham yeah. and that they were much larger than today. So what did they probably look like mm. and what was what were they referring to? Well, here's the Siberian unicorn which walked the earth with humans. Now, that's an impressive horn. <laughs> Definitely. So that's the unicornness. Yeah. That's the unicorn. And it has one horn. See how Christ's kingdom is, is one kingdom. A horn is a kingdom. There's only one kingdom and there's only one king. That's it. And that's a true one. And there's a false one. Exactly. And he's a little horn. <laughs> he's a little horn. <laughs> he's not going <laughs> to compete with that one. <laughs> All right, so now let's continue our story. He couched, he lay down as a lion, as a great lion who shall stir him up. Blessed he that blesses thee, and cursed is he that curses thee. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together, and Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. You know, Martin, he smote his hands together. It makes me think of the king of Babylon, Belshazzar. Yeah. When that writing appeared upon the wall, it wasn't his hands that smote together, but his knees that <laughs> smote <laughs> together. The anti-typical Balak's knees are going to might together, together yes. at some stage. So you can't curse him if no. he does what is right. But that was, uh, I, I was thinking uh, that when we did, nothing for uh, against the truth but for the truth. But nevertheless, out of the story we glean, there are three angles of attack. Yes. And the safest angle is to take them little group by little group. Infiltrate little mm. group by little group and get them to partake in paganism. And that will start the problems inside. Dressed like truth. Yeah. Okay. So he says, Therefore now flee thou to thy place. Get away. That's what he says to him. I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord has kept thee back from honor. And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to thy messengers, which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balak would give me the house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandments of the Lord, to do either good or bad of mine own mind, but what the Lord says, that I will speak. And now behold, I go unto my people. Come therefore, and I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. Mm. So now he gets a vision and he tells Balak what's going to happen to all the pagan nations in the world when Christ sets up his kingdom. When does Christ set up his kingdom? When Christ came the first time. Yes. And he said the kingdom of God has come near unto you. And yes. people are pressing in, right? So what will happen in the Christian era? The last period in this earth's history. Yeah. And it lasts two days because he gave two days worth of wages. money, wages. And, and if you believe in the cosmic week, Martin, then two days' wages were given to the church to take care of the beaten ones, the little wayward ones that have to be picked up in the world. Yes. That means 2,000 years and then there will come the second coming. There will be a final battle of the millennium and then the end will come. But what happens in that last period of time when Christianity reigns? So let, let's behold. Let's go to this people. Come and I will show thee what this people shall do to you during the Christian era. Yeah. Let's paraphrase it that way. So before returning to his people, Balaam uttered the most beautiful and sublime prophecy of the world's redeemer and the final destruction of the enemies of God. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. So Balaam's final oracle, latter days, Christian era, 
spiritual Israel, and it's going to be a prophecy. So let's read it. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor has said, and the man whose eyes are open has said. He has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling, but having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not night. Still for a while to mm -hmm. come. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall arise out of Israel. That's the messianic promise, Jesus. right? And shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. So he's going to absorb many from those nations. Mm. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies. And Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. That's a fascinating prophecy. So here is the prophecy of the Christian era. There's a great battle going on. Mm -hmm. And the battle is with Babylon, with the three components. As we had here in type, so we will have it in antitype. Yes. Now, Jewish commentators have always stated that the city that is being referred to over here is a reference to Rome. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. So, that so he shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. That will be the rim. And Babylon is also called the city. Yes. Now Babylon has a king. <laughs> yes. There's a dragon, there's a beast, and there's a false pr prophet. So it's a false trinity. That's it. There is a, the father, who is the dragon. There is the beast, that is the son. And there is the false prophet, that is the Holy Spirit. So modern manifestations of the Spirit, won't you find them largely under the false prophet? Yeah, hmm? definitely. The son, he wants all power. Everybody has to bow down to him. Do we see kings bowing down to him, religious leaders bowing down to him? Everybody. Uh, everybody. Do you want to be associated with the beast power? No. With the false prophet? No. With a dragon? No. No. But better beware. Exactly. C and be careful because you can be sucked in if you don't have your eyes open. Yes. Now Amalek was a descendant of Esau. Mm. Now it's very interesting when you go into that who the equivalent would be today. Ishmael. And who, who says that they belong to Ishmael? That they're Ishmaelites. Let's leave it at that. Mm. And when he looked on Amalek... He took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. And he looked on the Kenites and took up his parable and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Nevertheless, the Kenite will, shall be wasted until Ashur shall carry thee away captive. Mm. So he's talking about Petra where they were up there in the rocks and made their nest in the rocks and uh, they were taken away captive. And he took up his parable and said, Alas, who shall live when God does this? And ships shall come from the coast of Kittim and shall afflict Ashur and shall afflict Eber and it also perish forever. And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place and Balak also went his way. Mm. So all the nations that we are referring to here will perish. That's what the statue of Daniel said, right? Exactly. The same. The stone. The stone that comes loose destroys everything. Everything is swept away. Yeah. And all the remnants of these nations and whatever their names are today, the only thing that will remain are those that are in Christ. That's it. And that are in harmony with his law. That's the only name as well. Those are the true Two aspects of the true religion. So Balaam, according to the scriptures, must have given a final piece of advice to Balak. Now this is interesting. Which would change the blessing into a curse. This advice entailed leading the Israelites into transgression of God's commands. And we read about it in Numbers 31 verse 16. Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam 
to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague amongst the congregation of the Lord. So beware of someone who tries to get you to compromise on the law. Mm. It's not so important which day you keep. Mm. It's not so important whether you obey the other commands, the health laws and this law and that law. It's not so important. It's not so important that we keep ourselves separate, a people that is separate. We must mingle. Yeah, we must just preach love. Yes. So watch out for those things. Mm. So disappointed in his hopes of wealth and promotion, in disfavor with the king, and conscious that he had incurred the displeasure of God, Balaam returned from his self-chosen mission. After he had reached his home, the controlling powers of the Spirit of God left him and his covetousness, which had been merely held in check, prevailed. Mm. He was ready to resort to any means to gain the reward promised by Balak. Balaam knew that the prosperity of Israel depended upon their obedience to God and that there was no way to cause their overthrow but by seducing them into sin. And he now decided to secure Balak's favor by advising the Moabites of the course to be pursued to bring a curse upon Israel. He immediately returned to the land of Moab and laid his plans before the king. So he came back. Now the Bible said that he gave counsel. Yeah. So he yeah. must have come back. Mm -hmm. So this is biblical. The Moabites themselves were convinced that as long as Israel remained true to God, he would be their shield. The plan proposed by Balaam was to separate them from God by enticing them into idolatry. If they could be led to engage in licentious worship of Baal and Ashtoreth, their omnipotent protector would become their enemy and they would soon fall prey to the fierce warlike nations around them. This plan was readily accepted by the king and Balaam himself remained to assist in carrying it into effect. Mm. And he witnessed the success of his diabolical scheme. He saw the curse of God visited upon his people and thousands falling under his judgment. But the divine judges, judgment that punished sin in Israel did not permit the tempters to escape. So the fate of Balaam was similar to that of Judas. And their characters bear a marked resemblance to each other. Both these men tried to unite the service of God and mammon. Exactly. Balaam didn't want to let go of that money. He was and Judas didn't want to let go of that money. And met with single failure. Balaam acknowledged the true God and professed to serve him. Judas believed in Jesus as the Messiah and united with his followers. But Balaam hoped to make the service of Jehovah the stepping stone to the acquirement of riches and worldly honor. There's someone else that wanted that. Yes, yes. Simon Magus. Simon Magus. And Simon Magus became the sorcerer to Nero. And uh, this is where false Christianity began. He wanted to buy the Holy Spirit. He cannot buy the Holy Spirit. He wanted the power without the obedience. And you see, we were talking about the money. It's also to have to want worldly honor. That's also, it's important to realize that it's not just physical money. It's that greed. Which church is the richest church, sits on the riches of the world, wants all the kings to bow down to it, wants all the honor, but refuses obedience to the commandments? Yeah. Isn't yeah. that Catholicism? That's it. The well, one with the other horn. The other horn. The little horn. The little horn. Not the unicornus. No. <laughs> Okay, all right, we don't have to read the whole quote, but uh, let's end with this last line here. The only safe course is to let our prayers go forth daily from a sincere heart as did David. Hold up my goings in thy paths that my footsteps slip not. Mm. We dare not be enticed. What is this Baal worship all about? Because it looks like the real thing. Oh, that's... We've spoken about this the whole time now. But it is a, a beast worship because it's based on salvation by works. But then you also have this false spirit. 
This, and so you've got this whole mix of everything false. At Peor, you have the whole catastrophe. You have the Babylonian conspiracy. Yeah. There's something to meet every need. Oh, that's so true. We've always mentioned it. You see the beast has open arms because he can accept anything. He can accept those that are willing to be saved in their sin and those that are willing to be saved by their works, by yeah. the lost. Yeah. So let's look at this. And Israel abode in Chittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Let's make that the typological story mm -hmm. with other churches. Yes. Because a church is a woman, woman in the Bible. And they called the people unto the sacrifice of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor and the against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. No, Moses was always willing to intercede. Mm -hmm. But here he said, slay every man that was joined to Baal Peor. So the meekest man other than Jesus to ever walk the earth. Here, gives a direct, seems like a very harsh command. But remember, Martin, this is a typology. Yes. This will be the consequence. If you are joined to Baal Peor, then this will be the consequence. So even our own people that are dabbling in this shouldn't they be warned of course you see some what boggles my mind sometimes is that people say oh but god does not how can he be a loving god if he says he's going to destroy you if you do not choose him but you have actually a choice, you how, have a choice. How, the other one doesn't give you a choice no <laughs> all right now we're thinking typologically and behold one of the children of israel came and brought Unto his brethren, a Midianitish woman. Now remember, the Midianites were from the loins of Abraham. And the Moabites were from Lot. Yeah. So they were also related to Abraham. So can we say these are like sister churches? Yes. So here comes someone from a sister church. You're opening your church to none law-keeping mm. uh, people to come and preach. Isn't that bringing a Midianitish woman into the tents? Definitely. In the sight of Moses and in the sight of the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So we will have churches where Midianitish churches, women, and Moabitish ones will come in. Yeah. And they will sound so pleasing. In this case, it was a literal woman with a very short dress that enticed <laughs> the Israelites. That's it. And how did they do it? So it would this whenever this comes in, it will be with smooth words, tickling the ears, something that you oh something, something that looks very desirable. Mm. And when Phineas, the son of Eliza, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it. He rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand and he went after the man of Israel into his tent and thrust both of them through. The man of Israel and the woman through her belly so that it was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. Martin, this yeah. is a terrible shaking that will take place. This is a typological shaking. And they were committing adultery spiritual adultery and the result of spiritual adultery is death that's it now how did they do it and the lord spoke unto moses saying phineas the son of elisa the son of aaron the priest has turned my wrath away from the children of israel while he was zealous for my sake amongst them and i consumed not the children of israel in my jealousy so do we need phineas's yes that will address the issue and say, this is spiritual idolatry. This is wrong. 
this is adultery. Yes. Should we ha should, must we have them? Yes. Yes. Otherwise the wrath would come upon the whole congregation. Yes. Wherefore say I behold I give unto him a covenant of peace and he shall have it and his seed after him even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. So we need people that preach the straight message and we need to stand together in this because various sections, little portions, mm -hmm. will be attacked by this methodology. Exactly. It will, that angle will be used. By yes. You. And then God still gives us more information. He says, now the name of the Israel that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish woman, was Zimri, mm -hmm. the son of Salu, a prince of a chief house amongst the Simeonites. So these are people in high places. Nothing these are leaders in the church. It, exactly. So this is not put in the Bible arbitrarily. No, no, no. This is very important. So don't look at every leader and say, well, he's a leader, so surely I can follow his example. And now let's read, read on. And the name of the Midianitish woman that was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zul. He was head over a people and of a chief house in Midian. So again, you have high up people, leaders taking part. And of course, music or musical. And Cosby means deceiver, a liar, sliding away. So how will it be done, Martin, mm. with music? Yeah. Now, many years ago, I gave a series of talks that was called Total Transformation, mm. where I dealt with this already. And I think people need to be